The United Nations Security Council is meeting to debate whether to adopt a draft resolution on Syria. The Council is deciding whether to adopt an Arab League plan calling for an end to violence and for President Bashar al-Assad to stand down. Qatar's Prime Minister urged Council members to take action against what he is calling Assad's killing machine. Russia says the plan amounts to regime change and could lead to civil war. It is expected to veto the resolution. I don't think Russian's policy is about asking people to step down, said Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. He told this to BBC. BBC's Barbara Plett at the UN says Western nations are hoping this session will soften Russian's resistance. In a note of optimism, Russian UN envoy Vitaly Turkin said the draft resolution contained elements of an earlier Russian text rejected by Western powers and the Arab League as too weak. This gives rise for hope, he said. We hope that the Council will come to consensus on the Syrian issue, as it is not only possible, but also necessary. The UN estimates more than 5,400 people have been killed since the unrest began last March. The violence appears to be intensifying, with more than 100 people were reported to have been killed across the country on Monday and at least 37 people on Tuesday, says the rights groups. The, re the draft resolution strongly condemns human rights abuses by the Syrian government and calls on all sides to cease the use of violence. It calls on countries to stop the flow of arms to Syria, but does not impose an arms embargo. Israel, Finland, and Sweden are seen as leading the way in cyber readiness, according to a major new security report. The McAfee-backed Cyber Defense Survey deemed China, Brazil, and Mexico as being among the least able to, to defend themselves against emerging, emerging attacks. The rank is based on leading experts' perceptions of a nation's defenses. The report concluded that greater sharing of information globally is necessary to keep ahead of the threats. It also suggests giving more power to law enforcement to fight cross-border crimes. The UK, with a grading of 4 out of 5, ranks favorably in the survey, along with the USA, Germany, Spain, and France. The rankings are based on the perceived quality of the country's cyber readiness, the ability to cope with a range of threats and attacks. The subjectiveness of the report is its biggest strength, explained Raj Samani, McAfee's chief technology officer. What it does is give the perception of cyber readiness by those individuals who, who kind of understand and work in a security on day in and day out basis. The U.S. National Archives has released long lost recordings of the Air Force One flight back to Washington on the day of John F. Kennedy's assassination. The tapes contain 42 minutes of audio that was not included on the original public version. It includes discussions of what to do with the slain president's body and a phone call to Rose Kennedy, his mother. The material was donated by a rare documents dealer who acquired it from the estate sale of a Kennedy's aide. The tapes provide new insight into the grief and confusion in the highest levels of the U.S. government in the hours after Kennedy's shooting in Dallas, Texas on Friday the 22nd of November 1963. Kennedy's adversary pinpointed Lyndon Johnson, was, who had just been sworn in as president, can be heard, barely audible through the crackle, consoling the dead president's mother. Mr. Johnson is on the plane with the body and Jackie Kennedy. The tapes also shed light on the previously unknown whereabouts of former Air Force Chief of Staff Curtis LeMay, an, advisory, uh, an adversary of Kennedy. In the recording, an aide can be heard trying to reach the general. Experts say the comments are likely to stir debate among conspiracy theorists who have long questioned why audio was missing from their official recordings in the first place. The National Archives has made the audio available to the public for the first time. Well, I think I'm safe when I say the weather has been pretty great the last few days. With the sun coming out yesterday and today, frankly, North Dakota isn't that bad of a place to be for winter, at least so far this year. Jessica Goldseth has more. Thanks, JT. Well, first off, happy February. And how strange that it feels like March or April. It most certainly feels like spring today. Everything's melting, and there are a lot of areas where you can see grass. Even though the grass is still brown, it really gives you that feeling of spring. I mean, we reached a high of 43 degrees today. The record for the month is a high 
in the low 50s, and even though we're not setting any records for highs, we are most certainly not setting records for lows. Tonight, we could see a little bit of fog with a low of about 20 degrees. And tomorrow, again, patches of fog for the early morning. And then as the morning turns to afternoon, that should all be clear and we'll see the sun as well as a high of 36 degrees. Expect some clouds overnight with a low of 19. Friday should be sunny and warm with a high of 32. Saturday, much like Friday with a, with a high, excuse me, in the low 30s. And Sunday should be clear as well with a high in the mid 30s. And Monday of next week, we will start off with temperatures in the 30s once again. One can only hope that since we started this week off with temperatures in the 30s, that because next Monday starts off the same, we'll continue to have this beautiful weather. So keep your fingers crossed, Jamestown. Now back to you, JT. Thank you, Jessica. Americans are as divided as ever between Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. Is there a psychological foundation for this red and blue split? Researchers at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln are studying liberals and conservatives' reactions to happy or pleasant photographs and scary or sad ones in an effort to learn more about the cognitive underpinnings of political preference. The findings. Conservatives tend to concentrate more on images considered to be negative, while liberals' eyes tend to linger on positive images, says political science professor John Hibbing. 75% is the success of Madden's Super Bowl winner prediction. Since 2004, the franchise has gone six out of eight. Now, is this due to realism of the game or is it just coincidence? We cannot be certain. The two wrong predictions include last year's Steelers vs. Packers and ironically, the 08 Giants vs. Patriots. This year, the simulation for the this year's Super Bowl matchup has the Giants coming away with the victory. So do you go with Madden or do you bet against the odds? Either way, the game should prove to be exciting. For more on sports, though, we go to Tom O'Neill. Tom? Thanks, JT. After having nearly a month straight of away games, the Jamestown Jimmies men and women basketball team are back home this evening hosting their bitter rival, Valley City State University. The women play at 5.30 and the men are at 7.30. Look for Travis Burley to have a good game tonight. In his past three games, Burley has not scored more than 12 points, and on the season, he's averaging nearly 16 points, so expect him to have a big one tonight as he bounces back in front of his home crowd. The Jamestown Jimmies men's baseball team has officially started yesterday. Although their first game is not till February 28th, the team seems fired up and destined for a successful season. I spoke with junior pinch runner Ben Holen, and he said, it's a good thing February finally came because I thought our guys were going to bust down the YMCA doors as they were ready to get in there and get nasty. In national sports news, after going into the All-Star break with a two-game win streak, the Minnesota Wild met the National Predators in St. Paul last night, and that win streak was brought to a halt. The Wild looked poised to win their third in a row, but gave up four goals in the third period and ended up losing. The Wolves were off last night, but are back home tonight hosting the Indiana Pacers. That about does it for sports. Back to you, JT. Thank you, Tom. Well, that's your news for Wednesday, February 1st, 2012. I'm JT Petch, and tune in tomorrow as we once again connect the campus with the community. Adios, Jamestown.